In this video, we begin unit four, which is all about anti-differentiation and integration. Now, anti-differentiation and integration are uh, two um, different but related um, processes. Um, we'll talk about this anti-differentiation in this video, and integration is related um, to this problem. Let's say you've got a function y equals f of x, and you want to find the area between that function and the x-axis on some interval from a to b. Um, we can find that by evaluating what's called a definite integral of that function. Um, so, and evaluating that definite integral requires us to um, do some anti-differentiation as well. So that's the plan, um, but let's talk about what anti-differentiation is. Let's say we've got y equals x cubed plus sine of x. We can take the derivative. Um, the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared, and the derivative of sine of x is cosine of x. That process is called um, differentiation. So we'll say the process of computing a derivative is called differentiation. Well, what is anti-differentiation? Anti-differentiation is doing that backwards. So we'll say with anti-differentiation, it's the process of finding the original function All right, it's actually going to be a, an original family of fun functions mm -hmm. I, honestly, I, I, that have a given derivative. Now we have lots of different notations for differentiation. If y is equal to f of x, we can use prime notation for the derivative. We can say y, uh, y prime, or we call that f prime of x. Um, we can use Leibniz notation. So we can say dy dx or df dx. Um, uh, sometimes we use this operator notation. It's, we use it less frequently. We might say d applied to the function y of x or d applied to the function f of x. Sometimes they use curly brackets. Sometimes they use the square brackets. Sometimes you might see a subscript x to say that we're differentiating with respect to x. Um, all of these are notations for the derivative. For computing the antiderivative, um, we usually use this integral notation. So we have the integral of f of x with respect to x, and that's how we read that. And it's implied that that's an indefinite integral, because there are no bounds here. We're going to have some numbers at the bottom and the top of that integral sign in a bit. The indefinite integral of f uh, with respect to x, um, it's also called the antiderivative of f. But you need that two days a day. So I'm like, we're actually, we'll say, well, we'll say the antiderivative. I was hesitant to use the word the as opposed to and because you actually have a family of functions that all have the same. Um, that is typically denoted by the following. We use capital F of X for one of those antiderivatives, and then we add a C, where C is just a constant, because the derivative of a constant is zero. And if I take the um, derivative of F of this capital F, I should get the lowercase f, um, because we're this is how we compute, or this is the notation for computing the antiderivative. Another notation that we can use is this operator notation. Rather than having a D, we can use D inverse of F. So that's equal to the integral of F of X with respect to X, the indefinite integral. So as an example, 
If we have y prime equals 3x squared plus cosine of x, if we want to know the um, original function y, we might be asked to compute the antiderivative of 3x squared plus cosine of x. And so you might ask yourself, well, what do I have to take the derivative of um, to get a 3x squared? Well, x cubed works, right? Because the derivative of x cubed is x squared. And then you might ask yourself, well, what do I have to take the derivative of to get a cosine of x? And you know, the answer is sine of x. And then we can add a plus c because the derivative of c is always zero. So if I take the derivative of this function, I get this function, um, that 3x squared plus cosine of x. So we know we did this correctly. Um, this is our um, antiderivative. We call that capital F of x of lowercase f of x with respect to x. And then this is our original function f of x. So basically, if we go from here to here by taking the derivative, using our derivative rules, we can do that backwards. Uh, now, it's helpful to actually have some, some rules that allow us to work in reverse. If there wasn't a 3 there, it might not be as obvious what that um, antiderivative would be, because we know the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. But what if it was just an x squared? What would I have to take the derivative of to get an x squared instead of a 3x squared? Um, we might want to uh, think about that. Um, by essentially adjusting all of those rules that we've studied from before. So every rule that we studied for our differentiation has an inverse rule for anti-differentiation. So here's an example. We know that the derivative of a constant is zero. So that means the anti-derivative of zero is always a constant. Because if I take the derivative of the constant, I get zero back. And if we have the derivative of f of x plus g of x, we get f prime of x plus g prime of x. So you just take the derivative term by term. Since that's true, if you have an antiderivative here of a sum of two functions, you can take the antiderivative term by term. It's just going to be the antiderivative of f plus the antiderivative of g of x. That's legal. Uh, what else? We know the derivative of a constant times f is equal to that constant times f prime. So the antiderivative of a constant times f is that constant times the antiderivative of f. So basically, we can do everything that we did before backwards. Now, this first one we can represent geometrically. If I have y equals 7, y prime is equal to 0. So the antiderivative of 0 would be some constant, and that constant might be 7. And the derivative of a sum is some of the derivatives. So the antiderivative of a sum is the sum of the antiderivatives. If I have a constant times a function, we just take the constant times the derivative of the function. So if we're taking an antiderivative, you can factor that constant out and just multiply by the antiderivative of the original function. Now, another rule that is really common is that constant multiple rule. If I have a constant times x, the derivative of a constant times x is a constant because it's just a slope, right? The derivative with respect to x of mx is the slope of that line, which is just that x value or that, that coefficient of x. Um, so if we do that backwards, we start with this k and we say, well, if k is my function, what is the function or, or if k is the derivative of the function, what function did I start with? Well, I think kx plus c will work because the derivative of kx would be k and the derivative of c would be zero. Um, since uh, if y equals, let's say, 3x has a slope of 3, and I tell you that the slope is 3, and I say, well, what does our original function have to be? Well, it could be 3x plus any constant, because adding that constant just shifts the graph up and down, and it doesn't change the slope at all. So we've got that. 
Now the power rule is a little bit strange. Um, it, this one's a little less intuitive. When we take the derivative of x to the n, we always bring the power down and multiply by x to the one less power. The antiderivative rule that goes with that is basically undoing that operation. And we've done two operations. We brought the power down and we multiplied by x to the one last power. So we have to undo those operations in the reverse order from the order that we did that. So the last thing we did was we multiplied by x to the one last power. So when we compute the antiderivative, we're going to um, add one to the exponent. So we're going to increase the exponent by one, whereas here we decrease the exponent by one. Um, and then the first thing we did was we multiplied by that exponent. Now here, um, rather than multiplying by the exponent, we're gonna divide by the exponent. And then don't forget to add C because the derivative of constant is zero. Here's you're saying, uh, I'm not really sure that I agree that that's true. Um, let's check it out. If we take the derivative with respect to X of X to the fifth, we get five X to the fourth. Now let's say I want the antiderivative of five X to the fourth. Well, since I have a constant times my x to the fourth, I bring that constant outside. And then I'm going to use my new power rule for the antiderivative. So we've got our five. And then here for the x to the fourth, we will add one to the exponent and then divide by the new exponent. And those fives will reduce. And then don't forget your plus c. And look, we got the x to the fifth back. So it works. Um, if we apply this constant multiple rule, and then we use this um, this power rule, which is just the inverse version of this power rule, it's just undoing those two operations of subtracting one from the exponent and multiplying that, that original exponent by adding one to the exponent and then dividing by the new exponent. Um, we actually get the original function back. It works. And if you're not sure, just plug in some values for n and convince yourself it's true. Now, this rule is only true for n not equal to negative 1. Because if n equals negative 1, we would be dividing by 0, which would be a problem. Um, now, um, we know oops, that the derivative with respect to x of natural log of x is 1 over x. And we've also shown that the derivative of natural log of negative x is 1 divided by negative x by the chain rule, because we've got a negative x inside a logarithmic function. The derivative of log of a function is 1 divided by that function times the derivative of the inside. And the derivative of the inside is negative 1. So we end up with negative 1 divided by negative x, which is just 1 over x. So whether we're taking the log of x or we're taking the log of negative x, the derivative is 1 over x. We can summarize that in a single rule that says the natural log of the absolute value of x is equal to 1 over x. Because the absolute value of x is equal to x when x is positive, or x, x when x is positive, or 0. And then um, it's equal to negative x when x is negative. And in either case, whether x, um, the argument is x or negative x, the slope is 1 over x when we look at the logarithmic function. Say, so, well, what's the inverse version of that? Well, if I'm taking the antiderivative of 1 over x, I say, well, what do I take the derivative of to get 1 over x? Turns out to be natural log of the absolute value of x plus c. Um, so that's one of our new rules. Um, one of the simplest rules, one of the simplest differentiation rules is the derivative of e to the x. That's one that's fun to explore geometrically. The slope of the e to the x graph um, is actually given by the y values on the e to the x graph. So that since the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, the antiderivative of e to the x is e to the x plus c. Um, so I can add a constant, and that's not going to change the shape of the graph at all. It's just going to shift the graph up and down. When I take the derivative, it's, which is focused on the slope, the derivative of that constant is 0, and we just get the e to the x back. Okay. Now the derivative with respect to x of a to the x um, was natural log of a, so natural log of the base times a to the x. So for example, the derivative with respect to x of 2 to the x is natural log of two times two to the x. Now we wanna do that backwards for our anti-differentiation rule. So we say, well, what's the antiderivative of a to the x? 
Well, if I was taking the derivative, I'd have to multiply by natural log of a and multiply by the, and then I take the original function and multiply it by natural log of a. When I'm taking the antiderivative, I divide by the natural log of a. And I have the original function times one over that natural log of a plus c. Um, and if you're not sure that that's true, just take the derivative. The derivative with respect to x of one divided by natural log of a times a to the x. Um, is that constant one over natural log of a times the derivative of a to the x. And the derivative of a to the x is one or is natural log of a times a to the x and the logs reduce and you just end up with an a to the x. So the derivative of this is that integrand. Um, so we call this, um, or this is the antiderivative of that. I forgot to introduce that terminology earlier. Um, so before we go on any further, this integral of f of x dx is read a number of ways. The indefinite integral of f of x, or f with respect to x. Sometimes people will just say the integral of f with respect to x, same thing. Um, this is an integral sign. When we compute the antiderivative, this tells us um, which variable we're anti-differentiating with respect to. We always um, anti-differentiate with respect to a particular variable. Call that a variable of integration. And then this function here is called the integrand. And this is the indefinite integral of f with respect to x, or sometimes they might call it the antiderivative of f with respect to x. And of course, it's always a family. And it's a family of antiderivatives because we always have that plus C and that plus C just shifts the graph up and down, but it doesn't change the slope at all. Um, okay, so we've got, I'm looking at my differentiation rules as we do this video. The derivative of a constant is zero, so the antiderivative of zero is a constant. The derivative of a constant times X is the constant, so the antiderivative of the constant is the constant times X plus C. Then we can do this backwards. And we can do this backwards, but we've got a new rule for that. We have x to the n plus one divided by n plus one. If you have the derivative of the sum, it's the sum of the derivative. So you can do that backwards. Just take the antiderivative term by term. The derivative of e to the x is e to the x. The antiderivative of e to the x, e to the x plus c, and so on. So we've gotten to this point. Now we don't have a rule for an antiderivative of a product until we learn about integration by parts. That's at the very beginning of calculus two, or sometimes it's in the second unit in calculus two, depending on how the instructor structures the course. But we're not going to have an inverse rule for this or a way to undo this product rule until we learn integration by parts, which happens next semester. If you want, you can look at the Calc two playlist and watch the videos if you'd like a preview. We also don't have a rule for this backwards. Um, although if you recognize the integrand is this, then you can write it as the derivative of this quotient and then the antiderivative of the derivative would be the quotient plus C. And the antiderivative of this composite function um, is going to require what's called U substitution and we'll do that later. Okay, so we know all of that. And then we also need antiderivative rules for these trig functions. Um, since the derivative of sine is cosine, the antiderivative of cosine is sine of x plus c. So the derivative of sine of x is cosine of x. The derivative of the c is zero. Since the derivative of cosine of x is negative sine of x, I can multiply both sides by negative one, and that would give me the antiderivative of sine of x. Oops, I forgot my dx is negative cosine of x plus c. Sometimes I get, um, I forget the SIGN sign out front for these antiderivative rules, but I always remember that the derivative of sine is positive cosine and the derivative of cosine is negative sine. 
So if I'm doing this calculation, I could always check my answer by differentiating. I say, is that supposed to be sine or negative sine? Well, the derivative of sine is positive cosine, so I know I'm good. And then I say, well, what's the derivative of negative cosine? It's negative one times negative sine, which is positive sine. So we're good, good to go there as well. We um, found that the derivative of tangent was equal to secant squared x. I think we used uh, the quotient rule for that, and then we simplified. So the antiderivative of secant squared x is equal to the tangent of x plus c. The um, derivative of um, secant of x is secant of x times tangent of x. We computed that using the quotient rule, I believe. So we have the antiderivative of secant times tangent. We get secant of x plus c. The antiderivative of, or the derivative of cosecant of x is negative cosecant of x cotangent of x. So if we multiply both sides by negative one, we have the antiderivative of cosecant of x cotangent of x is negative cosecant of x plus c. So it's just basically all the same derivative rules, but backwards. And the only uh, trick function that we're still missing is um, this uh, cotangent. The derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared x. If we multiply both sides by negative one, the antiderivative of cosecant squared x is negative cotangent of x plus c. So we know those. Now, um, there were a few more rules that we learned. Uh, we learned these derivatives of the inverse trig functions. Okay. And we um, found those uh, using, uh, what was it called? Uh, implicit differentiation. Um, we can also use uh, the, uh, the lesson on the derivatives of inverse functions in order to find these expressions. These are going to correspond to particular antiderivatives as well. Um, in order to do that, I'm gonna uh, do some derivative formulas that involve some extra constants inside here. And then I'll show you um, what the corresponding derivative should be. And then we'll, we'll come up with a corresponding antiderivative rule. And then the hyperbolic functions are very similar to those uh, regular trig functions. We have backwards versions of these as well. The antiderivative of hyperbolic cosine of x is hyperbolic sine of x plus c. The antiderivative of hyperbolic sine of x is hyperbolic cosine of x plus c. The antiderivative of this guy is that guy plus c. The antiderivative of that one is that one plus c, and so on. Um, but with these three, we usually multiply both sides by negative one. So the antiderivative of these without the negative one is, uh, are these three functions without the negative one, are these three functions multiply the negative one plus three. And so um, it's very standard, very straightforward. And we can come up with a formula sheet for basic anti-differentiation rules, just like we have this formula sheet for basic differentiation rules. Um, okay, so let's look at those uh, six inverse trig functions. Now, if I have arc, say, arc sine of x divided by a, where a is a constant, and I want to take the derivative of that, I have to use the chain because I've got this function nested inside the arc sine function. Now I know it's been a while since we have done anything with the arc sine function. So just as a reminder, the derivative of arc sine of x is one divided by the square root of one minus x squared. We computed that before. So if I've got this x over a inside that arc sine function, the derivative is one divided by the square root of one minus the inside function squared, so you substitute in x divided by a, and then you multiply by the derivative of, with respect to x of x divided by a. Now you could use the quotient rule here, but a is just a constant. The quotient rule would be overkill, right? If I had x divided by three, I would just write that as one third times x. So this is much easier to evaluate if we just square the numerator and square the denominator there. And then we'll call this the derivative with respect to x of one over a times x. And what's the derivative of a constant times x? It's just the constant. So we end up with a one over a there. Now, when we simplify, we've got 
1 divided by the square root of 1 minus x squared over a squared times 1 over a. And I want to distribute that a under the radical. I can do that if I write it as, um, I write the a as the square root of a squared. And we can do that because we're assuming a is positive. And then when we distribute, we'll have the square root of a times the square root of b is the square root of a times b. So we're just going to distribute that a squared to each term in here. a squared times 1 is a squared. a squared times x squared divided by a squared is going to give us a negative x squared, and it's still under the radical. And that's, again, because the square root of b times the square root of a is the square root of a times b. So the radical is still there. We're just multiplying those expressions under the radical to get this answer. So if the derivative of arc sine of x over a is this, the antiderivative of this is arc sine of x over a plus c. So for example, if I see the integral of this one divided by um, the square root of 16 minus x squared, I say, well, that looks like that, where a squared is 16, so a equals 4, and then just pattern matching, I know if I take the derivative of arc sine of x divided by 4, I should get that square root of 16 minus x squared back. And then we have a plus C. Um, so that's what we get there for our arc sine rule. Similarly, if we take the derivative with respect to X of arc tangent of X divided by A, well, we'll use the um, chain rule again. And recall that the derivative with respect to X of arc tangent of X was just one divided by one plus x squared. Well, if I'm using the chain rule with this function as my inside function, the derivative of arctan of x over a is one divided by one plus the inside function squared. And then we multiply by the derivative of the inside. And again, x divided by a is the same as one over a times x. That's just a constant times x. The derivative of a constant times x is just our constant. And if we want, we can uh, square the numerator and square the denominator of that to simplify. So I get a one over a for this. And I want to distribute that here. And I need another a to um, get clear that a squared. So I'll multiply by a over a as well. Then in our numerator, we get an a. And then in the denominator, we have a squared times one, which is a squared plus x squared over a squared times a squared, which is x squared. So the derivative of arc tangent of x over a is a divided by a squared minus x squared. Now, if I want to, I can divide both sides by one over a. And so we'll have the derivative with respect to x of one over a times arc tangent of a is one divided by a squared plus x squared. So if I multiply both sides by a, I get this one. And that's legal because the derivative of a constant times a function is that constant times the derivative of the function. So we can do that. That's legal. It's fine. So if the derivative of this is equal to that, that means the antiderivative of that expression is equal to 1 over a, oops, that should be an x over a, times arctan of x over a, plus c. So as an example, if I have the antiderivative 5 divided by 9 plus x squared. I say that looks a lot like that, but I've got a 5 in the numerator. So I can factor that 5 out. 5 times 1 divided by 9 plus x squared um, is equal to that original integrant. I forgot my dx. I don't know how I'm doing that. Now this uh, matches that pattern. Um, a squared is 9, so a equals 3. So we're going to have 5 times 1 third times the arctan of x divided by 3 plus c. And if we write that 5 as itself over 1, we end up with 5 thirds arctan of x over 3 plus c. Easy breezy. Um, so that's another one of our rules. And then finally, we know the derivative with respect to x of arc secant of x 
was one divided by the absolute value of x times the square root of x squared minus one. If we replace x with x over a, we have to use the chain rule. So we'll have one divided by the absolute value of our inside function times the square root of our inside function squared minus one. Our inside function is x divided by a. And then we multiply with by the derivative of the inside, which is one over a times x by the chain. And so we end up with one divided by this absolute value of x over a times the square root of x squared divided by a squared minus one. And then we've got a one over a here. This a times that x over a reduces. And you might say, I really want to clear that a squared under the denominator or in the denominator of that, that fraction. So I'm going to multiply by a divided by a. So it's just a well-chosen one. It doesn't change anything. But I want that to go under the radical so I can distribute. So I'll square it and take the square root. And that's just an a because a is a positive. So when we do that, we're going to have the uh, 1 divided by the absolute value of x. And if I distribute that a squared to this x squared divided by a squared, I get x squared. And if I distribute the a squared to the negative 1, I have negative a squared there. And we still have an a in the numerator. So the derivative of arc secant of x over a is a um, divided by the absolute value of x times the square root of x squared minus a squared. So that means if I divide both sides by 1 over a, the derivative with respect to x of 1 over a times the arc secant of x over a is 1 divided by the absolute value of x times the square root of x squared minus a uh, squared. Now, when we have the um, inverse rule, they sort of move the absolute value bars around. So the, we end up with okay. one, if uh, the antiderivative of this, but without the absolute value bars, is equal to one over a times arc secant of the absolute value of x divided by a. But the, the absolute value actually moves to this side as well. All right, so we've got those, those three. And if we multiply the numerators by negative ones, we would have our cosine, our cotangent, and our cosecant. Um, but I have a tendency to just stick to these three functions and then just multiply the, the results by negative one instead. So I'll have a negative arc sine rather than an arc cosine, or a negative arc tangent rather than an arc cotangent. Um, and then, of course, we have these rules backwards as well. Well, um, So now with all of that, we are ready. Uh, to apply our basic anti-differentiation rules to some problems. Um, most of the time, we are using this power. This, if I've got x to some power, the antiderivative is x, or uh, comes from adding one to the exponent and then dividing by the new exponent and then adding c. But we also have all of those other rules uh, for uh, the derivative of, or that correspond to derivatives of exponents, uh, the derivative of the logarithm being one over x and so on. Uh, so we can put all of those together to create a new formula sheet for our antiderivative rules. So this is our summary of all of the rules that we just talked about. They're just the um, sort of the backwards version of all of our derivative rules. Um, we said the derivative of a constant is zero, so the, the antiderivative of zero is a constant and so on. And we know that we can take the uh, derivatives of all these functions on the right, and we can get these functions on the left. And similarly, we can take the derivative of all these trig functions on the right, and we'll get these functions on the left. Um, but of course, these are antiderivatives now. We're just doing that backwards. Um, since the derivative of this was this, the antiderivative of this is that. Since the derivative of this function is this function, the antiderivative of this function is that function, um, and so on. So we've got sort of this pattern matching uh, thing happening here. Now, this one we haven't talked about yet. This is what is this is sort of the formula that we use and what's called U substitution. We'll talk about that more after we learn our basic differentiation rules. That's when we can't apply our basic differentiation rules because the integrand is too involved. Sometimes if we choose the right inside function, um, we're able to find the antiderivative as a composite function. So I put that on there just so that you can have it. If you want, you can watch the use of videos from previous semesters. 
Um, but that's there on our basic rule sheet because it's really important and you're gonna be using it a lot. Um, then we've got the um, inverse version of all of our um, derivative rules for the six trig functions. But um, on this list, we don't have the derivatives or the antiderivatives of tangent, cotangent, secant, or cosecant, but all of those we'll be able to derive formulas for once we learn this technique, which is called U substitution. And then we had the derivative rules for the hyperbolic functions. I just said, well, when I know a derivative rule, I also know the corresponding antiderivative rule. So those are these six at the top, but and because of the form of those uh, derivatives, we don't have antiderivatives for hyperbolic tangent, hyperbolic cotangent, hyperbolic secant, or hyperbolic cosecant. But we'll be able to find those using this method over here, which is called um, U substitution. And we'll be learning that sort of towards the end of unit four. Um, and then we don't have an inverse version of the product rule or the quotient rule, although the closest thing that we have to that is called integration by parts. Usually that is taught at the beginning of calculus two. Okay, so these are our basic rules. Now, whenever we see a new integral, we ask ourselves if the basic rules apply. If the basic rules apply, we just apply them. But sometimes we have to rewrite the integral first or the integrand first so that the basic rules apply. Often we have to get this, these expressions in the form of a constant times x to some power um, or um, where that power is not equal to negative one or just a constant times one over x um, or something like that or some combination of these so that um, we can use our basic rules. Just a little bit of algebra. Um, the properties from algebra that we need are the following. Yeah. One thing that we need to remember is that x to the m divided by n is the nth root of x to the m. So if I have an nth root of x to the m in my integrand, I don't have a rule for that, but if I rewrite it as a rational exponent, I do. The one thing that I would point out is if that um, if you have a, an n in uh, the denominator here, that becomes the index of the radical, and that also works in reverse. So we'll be using that um, frequently when we um, see radical expressions uh, in our integrand. Also, if you have a plus b divided by c, you can write that as a divided by c plus b divided by c. And often um, those two expressions can be simplified so that we can apply our basic rules. Um, so we use that a lot. Um, we have this rule, if we have x to a negative power, that's the same as one over x to the positive power. We don't have a rule for this, but we do have a rule for that as long as n is not equal to one. If n is equal to one, well, the antiderivative of one over x is natural log of the absolute value of x. So we can just apply a basic rule in that case. Um, and then for, um, I think that's pretty much it. And if you ever have, let's say, something like x cubed divided by five, you would rewrite this as not x cubed over five, but think of that as a one times x cubed divided by five. So that's one over five times x cubed over one, which is just one fifth x cubed. Once I've rewritten that x cubed over five as one fifth of x cubed, then I can just use a constant multiple rule and the power rule together to find the antiderivative of that. So that's a, a common one as well. So I think with these rules um, and um, our other exponent properties, x to the n times x to the m is x to the n plus m. When you distribute, you just add the exponent. And the same would be true if you had diff um, a, a different base, like an e to the x. So if it's e to the n times e to the m, that's e to the n plus m as well. Um, so whether it's an exponent function or a power function, the rule uh, works in exactly the same way. Um, and then we also use this one, x to the n divided by x to the m is x to the n minus m. That allows us to write that quotient as x to some power so that we can use the power of it. Um, so let's look at some uh, anti-differentiation problems and try to apply our basic rules. And then if necessary, we'll rewrite the integrand first before applying the basic rules. So here's our first example. I look at that integrand and I say to myself, do I have a rule for that? And the truth is I don't. And because I've got a, a sum of a bunch of terms up here and then I'm dividing everything by that five times that square root of x. 
Well, in order to evaluate this, I need to rewrite it. Since I've got a sum of terms in the numerator and just one term in the denominator, I can take each of those in the numerator and divide by that five times the square root of x. So we'll do that. And then I say to myself, do I have a rule for these? Well, not technically, but the square root of x, remember, is actually an x to the one half power. So there's a, an implied one there and an implied two there. Whenever you have a square root, um, the index is that implied two. That's x to the one half. And so I've got an x to the one half in each of these denominators. Yeah. And I can factor out the constants from each of these. And then those x to the one halves reduce, and you still have an implied one in that numerator. So you've got a negative one fifth at that last term there. Question is, do I have a rule for that? I've got a rule for this, but this needs to be simplified, and this needs to be simplified, and this needs to be simplified. These can be simplified by subtracting the exponents. We have x to the n divided by x to the m is x to the n minus m. So here I've got three fifths. Um, this is x squared divided by x to the one half. So that's x to the two minus one half or three halves power minus two fifths times x to the one minus one half or x to the one half. And then I can factor out a one fifth from here. And this is one fifth times one over x to the one half. Now remember one over x to the n is actually x to the negative n. So we can rewrite this as x to the negative one half. And then we say, do I have a rule for that? And we sure do. Um, I've got constants times x to some power, in this case, this case, in this case, and I have the antiderivative of a constant in that case. Uh, when we take the antiderivative of a sum or difference of terms, we just take the antiderivative term by term. So for each one, we bring that um, constant down, and then we're going to use our power rule. So we've got x to the 3 halves power. Now for our power rule for anti-differentiation, we add 1 to the exponent and then divide by the new exponent. So we've got three halves plus one. Now three halves plus one is three halves plus two halves, right? So if we add the numerators, we get five halves. We're gonna have x to the five halves, and then we'll divide by five halves. Dividing by five halves is the same as multiplying by two fifths. Then we've got a negative two fifths here times x to the one half plus one. One half plus one is one half plus two halves. So we add the numerators, we get three halves. So this is going to be x to the three halves divided by three halves. Dividing by three halves is the same as multiplying by two thirds. Then we add one fifth times x to the negative one half plus one. Negative one half plus one is negative one half plus two halves. Negative one plus two is one half. So this is x to the one half power. And then dividing by one half is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. So that's multiplying by two over one. And then the antiderivative of a constant is a constant times x, because the derivative of a constant times x is just a constant, the, the slope of that line. And then don't forget to add the plus c because the derivative of c is zero. And then we simplify the coefficients, just multiply straight across. <laughs> And you can leave your answer like this if you want to, or each of those rational exponents can be written in terms of roots if you prefer. So you don't have to do this, but if you want to, you can say that that's the square root of x to the fifth. x to the three halves is the square root of x cubed. x to the one half is just the square root of x. And that's our antiderivative. So we use a lot of exponent properties. Um, and then after we get that 
expression in a form that we have basic rules for. We apply the basic rules to each term and then just add the one plus C at the end. Now, if you want to check your answer, just take the derivative with respect to X of this function here. So now we're differentiating rather than anti-differentiating. We take the derivative, we bring the constant down, and then the derivative of x to some power is that power times x to the one less power. Five halves minus one is five halves minus two halves, which is three halves. Then we bring that constant down, multiply by x to the one less power, um, or times the um, exponent. So we bring the exponent down, and then we multiply by x to the one less power, which is three halves minus one, or three halves minus two halves, which is one half. And we bring this constant down, and uh, when we're taking the derivative, we bring that power down, and multiply by x to the one less power. One half minus one is negative one half. And then the derivative of a constant times x is just a constant, and the derivative of a constant is zero. So if I simplify this now, two goes into six three times, five goes into 25 five times, end up with three fifths of x to the three halves, three goes into 15 five times, two goes into four twice, end up with negative two fifths times x to the one half. These twos reduce and I have a one fifth x to the negative one half minus one fifth. My claim is that if I took the anti or if the derivative of this is this, then the antiderivative of this function is the function that we got at the end. So is that the same function as our original integrand? And if we did all of our algebra correctly, I think it is. That's our integrand right there. And that's the same function that we got here. Um, we had to do a lot of algebra first to get it in the form um, necessary to apply our basic rules. So, so we've got that. So that's one example where you have to use a lot of algebra to rewrite something. Now let's look at another example. So let's say I've got the um, integral of 2e to the x minus a sine of x plus uh, 3 divided by x with respect to x. Well, um, I can take the antiderivative of this as the antiderivative of a constant times e to the x. We bring the constant down. The antiderivative of e to the x is e to the x. And then I say, I'm going to subtract the antiderivative of sine of x. Now, if we don't remember, the antiderivative of sine of x is negative cosine of x. Make sure you put that in parentheses. So I'm subtracting negative cosine of x. So that will be ultimately adding cosine of x. Now this, I don't have a basic rule for, but I could rewrite it as with a basic rule. Three divided by x is the same as three times one over x. Because if I wanted to, I could call that three divided by one times one divided by x. We multiply straight across, we get that. So this is actually just one over x, which we have a rule for times a three. So we'll have two e to the x plus cosine of x plus three times the antiderivative of one over x, which is natural log of the absolute value of x plus c. And the claim is that if we take the derivative of this, we'll get this back. We can check the derivative with respect to x of two e to the x plus cosine of x plus three natural log of the absolute value of x plus c is the derivative of 2e to the x, which is 2e to the x. The derivative of cosine is negative sine of x. Then we have 3 times the derivative of natural log of the absolute value of x, which is 1 over x, plus the derivative of c, which is 0. And again, if we write that as 3 over 1 and multiply straight across, we get our original integrand. So we know we did this correct. All right, here's another one. Let's say we have the antiderivative of five times a three to the x. So I'd factor out that five 
And then I have the antiderivative of three to the x. Well, the derivative of three to the x is natural log of three times three to the x. So the antiderivative, instead of multiplying by that natural log of three, requires dividing by natural log of three. So we are multiplying by one over natural log of three times the original exponential plus c. And we can write that as five over one times one over natural log of three. So to, so to simplify, we'll have five divided by natural log of three um, times three to the x. That's just a constant times the exponential function plus c. And if we take the derivative of this, the derivative of three to the x is natural log of three times three to the x. The natural logs will reduce and we'll just get this plus the derivative of our constant, which is zero. And so that is one of our basic rules. Now let's say we've got five divided by 100 plus x squared minus one divided by um, two x times the square root of x squared minus four plus um, three fourths of the square root of one minus x squared. Well, I recognize the forms there. This looks like a uh, one over a squared plus x squared, and that is an arctangent function. And this looks like x times the square root of x squared minus a squared in the denominator. That looks like our arc secant function. And then this one has got an a squared minus x squared under the radical. That looks like our arc sine function. So that's what we have here, but we have some constants multiplying those functions. So we want to factor out those constants first because we want a numerator with a one here and just a coefficient of one multiplying that um, expression involving x in the denominator. So I'm going to say that this is itself times one. So if we want to, we can factor out a five divided by one, which is just a five and multiply it by 100, one over um, 100 times or 100 plus x squared. And we do have a rule for this. So now I have a constant times something that I have a rule for. The constant here is that one half. There's still an implied one in that numerator. We have one half times one over x times the square root of x squared minus four. And then this has a three fourths. And there's an implied one in that numerator as well. And in each case, we can identify our a squared. This is a squared plus x squared, where a squared is 100. So a equals 10. This is x squared minus a squared, where a squared equals 4. So a equals 2. This is a squared minus x squared, where a squared equals 1. So a equals 1. So we have different a values for each part of this problem. Okay, so we've got five times the antiderivative of one over a squared plus x squared. That's our arc tangent rule. And the antiderivative of that is one over a times arc tangent of x over a plus c. So I'm gonna have one over a times arc tan of x over a plus c. And my a is 10. So we have a 10 here and here. And there's an implied one there, so we can multiply straight across and then simplify. And then this one is an arc secant. Um, the antiderivative of x, or 1 divided by x times the square root of x squared minus a squared, is 1 over a times arc secant of the absolute value of x over a. Here a is 2. So we're going to have uh, 1 over a times the arc secant of the absolute value of x divided by a plus b. a is two this time. And then we've got three fourths times um, this antiderivative. And since a is one, it turns out to be that this is the arc sine of x over a, but a is just one. Arc sine is the only one of those that doesn't have that factor of one over a up front. And don't forget your plus C at the end. Now you could technically have a plus C here, plus C here, and plus C here, but the sum of those three arbitrary constants is just a different arbitrary constant. So we just let this one constant um, absorb all three of those. So some, we say the sum of the original three is that, that one, that plus C at the end.
So we'll simplify. Five um, divided by 10 is going to be one half. So you have one half of arc tangent of x divided by 10 minus one half times one half is one fourth times arc secant of the absolute value of x divided by two plus three fourths times the arc sine of x divided by one, which is just x plus c. All right, so that's a basic, it's just three basic rules. And we had to do a little bit of algebra to make sure that we factored out the constants appropriately. All right, so I think we've done an example of all of these. And then these three. We haven't done u substitution yet. We'll learn that later. And then we haven't done anything with these trig functions. So let me make up a problem that has a bunch of trig functions. So let's say we've got um, two cosine of x over three minus um, five sine of x plus tangent, or actually let's say secant squared divided by four minus um, cosecant of x times cotangent of x divided by two plus, I don't know, secant squared x. Oh, I already used secant squared. Sine, cosine, secant squared, cotangent, uh, cosecant. I need a cosecant squared. And let's do, we need that cos, uh, secant tangent in there somewhere. So we'll say plus uh, five times secant times tangent all over um, seven bx. Okay, I want to factor out the constants and then just take the antiderivative of each of the corresponding functions. So this two cosine of x divided by three is actually two thirds of cosine of x. So I'm looking for that constant in the numerator and denominator, factor it out. The negative five is just there, so we keep that there. Secant squared divided by four is the same as one times secant squared divided by four. So that's a one fourth of secant squared. So now I can use a constant multiple rule for that. I'm subtracting cosecant of x times cotangent of x divided by two. So the coefficient is a negative one half. Some people think it's silly that I emphasize these things, but there are a lot of students that get confused by it. So I, I try to emphasize it every time. So I've got that negative one half there times that cosecant cotangent. And then here the coefficient is five sevenths. Okay. And so for each of these guys, you're saying, do I have a rule for that? I have a constant times cosine of x. You say, what do I have to take the derivative of to get cosine? Sine works, right? The derivative of sine is cosine. So the antiderivative of cosine is sine. Then we bring the negative five down and you say, what do I have to take the derivative of to get sine? Well, negative cosine will work. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. So negative sine times uh, negative would give me that positive sine. So the antiderivative of sine is negative cosine. Then we bring the one fourth down. You say, what do you take the derivative of to get secant squared? That's tangent of x. Bring that negative one half down. You say, what do you have to take the derivative of to get cosecant of x, cotangent of x, negative cosecant of x. What do you have to take the derivative of to get cosecant squared x, negative cotangent of x? And then we bring the five sevenths down. What do you have to take the derivative of to get secant of x times tangent of x? It's secant of x. Don't forget your plus c. And then simplify. Now, make sure you include those parentheses. Otherwise, it looks like you're subtracting when you're really multiplying. So you've got two-thirds sine of x plus five times cosine of x plus one-fourth tangent of x plus one-half cosecant of x minus cotangent of x plus five seven secant of x plus c. And if we take the derivative of this, the derivative of this piece is two thirds times sine of, or two thirds times cosine of x, which is what we have right there. It's in a slightly different form. The derivative of five times cosine of x is negative five sine of x, which is what we have right there. The derivative of one fourth tangent of x is one fourth secant squared x, which is equivalent to what we have right there. The derivative of one half cosecant of x is negative one half cosecant of x cotangent of x, which is equivalent to that right there. 
the derivative of negative cotangent of x is cosecant squared x, which is what we have. And the derivative of 5 7 secant of x is 5 7 secant of x tangent of x, which is equivalent to that. Don't forget your plus c. Um, so we did that correctly. So we just applied some basic rules and learned how to factor out some constants as necessary. And then we have sort of a sim similar variation with these hyperbolic functions. It's easy to get confused between the hyperbolic functions and the trig functions because of the SIGN signs. But remember, when you take the derivative of hyperbolic sine, cosine, or tangent, you get a positive answer, a hyperbolic cos uh, sine, hyperbolic sine, or hyperbolic uh, secant squared. Now, the derivatives of hyperbolic cotangent, hyperbolic secant, and hyperbolic cosecant all have negative signs out front. So when you do the sort of reverse version of that, you're going to have negatives in your answer. So if we are looking at something like this, be careful whenever you see that h because it's not the same as your trig functions. You just have to worry about the signs. So maybe we've got 2 times the hyperbolic cosine of x minus um, hyperbolic cosecant squared uh, plus 3 hyperbolic uh, secant times hyperbolic tangent. And again, you're saying to yourself, what do I have to take the derivative of to get this function? Well, the derivative of hyperbolic sine is hyperbolic cosine. So the antiderivative of hyperbolic cosine is hyperbolic sine. And that constant 2 just comes down. And then you say, well, what do I take the derivative of to get this negative hyperbolic cosecant squared x? Well, it's hyperbolic cotangent of x. And that's supposed to have a negative derivative. So we take the derivative of this and we get the negative answer. That's what we want. And then um, the 3, that comes down. And then you say, what do you take the derivative of to get this hyperbolic secant times hyperbolic uh, tangent? It's going to be negative hyperbolic secant of x. And that's negative because the derivative of the hyperbolic secant, hyperbolic cosecant, and hyperbolic cotangents are all negative. So when we do the inverse version or the antiderivative version, we get a negative sign there. And don't forget your plus c. All right. Now, we haven't really talked about the geometry of this, uh, but these are families of functions. If we actually graph these functions and we graph the derivatives, we'll see that we have infinitely many families. When c equals 0, we have um, an antiderivative of this. When c equals 5, we have an antiderivative of this. When c equals negative 10, we have an antiderivative of this. It's the same graph, just shifted up and down. But they all have the same slope, the same derivative function, and that derivative is the original integrand. Um, Solving that equation where we have y prime equals this, the derivative equals this, what is the original function? It's called solving a differential equation. So we're going to talk more about that, differential equations, and what are called initial value problems, which allows you to pick out the right value of c so that your graph passes through a certain point. We'll talk about that in the next video. Um, but first, in order to do that, in order to solve those equations, we need to know how to compute antiderivatives. And that just comes from computing derivatives backwards using our basic antidifferentiations. Um, so that's it. Um, there is a set of slides uh, for um, practice antidifferentiation problems that I have a tendency to use in Calculus 2. Um, if I can find it, I'll try to find a way to post it online somewhere so that you can practice. It's just got like, 15 problems or so, 12 or 15 problems that we work in class. And you've got to do a little bit of algebra in order to evaluate the antiderivatives. Um, and then you apply the basic rules. And I don't think that there's any substitute for um, actually practicing yourself. Um, I can show you how to do these problems all day. And you can watch and write down and take excellent notes. But until you're the one practicing, until you're the one doing it, um, I don't think the rules start to stick. Um, but if you practice enough, um, you will um, start to commit these rules to memory. Um, I have my students memorize all of these rules um, so that they can efficiently compute antiderivatives. Um, in this class, and in calculus too, and in differential equations where they're so important and so necessary. Um, but these are our basic um, antidifferentiation rules. Um, I have my students learn all of these, plus these four that we'll talk about after we learn mu substitution, and these four, which we'll talk about after we learn mu substitution. 
and the use of substitution rule and the rule for integration by parts, which is next semester um, or in calculus too. Um, so if you want right now would be a good time to, to create a formula sheet like this or make some flashcards and start committing these to memory. And if you want also another thing, another thing you can do is actually graph the functions, graph the antiderivative or this original function and its antiderivative and then think about the slope of this function as being that integrand um, to help you understand the concept. But when evaluating antiderivatives, really you're just pattern matching. You're trying to find the right function um, or find the right formula from the sheet. Um, but just remember what it actually is. If you take the derivative of this function, you get this function, which means that this function is uh, represents the slope of this function. And since I've got a plus C in all of these, that means all these antiderivatives are families of functions. We've got infinitely many functions. They all have the same slope. These are just the same shape shifted up and down C units, depending on whether C is positive or negative. 